Would anybody like a little bass solo while we wait? set a date and then you have a date and then if we get to the date and you can't do it you can't do it but what else do you play good to know good to know <laughs> I saw you had a nice setup at your place I saw it when I was feeding uh, Expanding the troops is really nice. That's when we get to the point where you only play once a month. It's really good. It's really good. Then you're not, you know, the leaders are actually thinking that far ahead. You're not planning for the structure. It's really quite wonderful when you get that, that that's going on. really well last week this by the way I'm engaged I'm turning off again thank you very much I'm turning I didn't even know people were coming so I think it changed I didn't think it would change anything I just leave it all the way it was and whoever made it made it whoever didn't didn't Or play some percussion?
You guys are closed down this morning, eh? We have bodies in the seat. Last night. <laughs> so good. Martin, I had to move the uh, Christian. light down the bottom. Sorry. <laughs> yep. That's what I was just thinking. Like, this is basically lighthouse, but in the sanctuary. Yeah. Good, good morning. Um, I think the first thing to say is congratulations. I mean, really congratulations if you made it in here. If you're on live stream, fantastic. Thanks. I know a few are on live stream. Give us a text, by the way. Uh, let us know if you're on and we can be praying for you. Um, how many churches have we got here? Because we've got folk from... Hello. Good to see you, Jerry. You've made it. So we've got, we've got people from Summit here. That's great. Thank you. Shout out to We like Summit. We've got Gormley Church here with Josh. Thank you. Am I not on? Is that better? Bend it a little closer to you. Bend it a little closer to you. Is it bend it a little closer? Closer. Bend it closer. Is that better? Yeah. That's better. Okay. So we've got Gormley. We've got any other churches here? You're welcome. It's fantastic. And if you're visiting us here, thank you for coming. And a few other people visiting us. That's great. I think you're either crazy or fantastic to make your way out here. And... Um, but it's wonderful to be with us. So um, I'm just going to check what I'm doing here. Uh, let's just say hello to each other very briefly. And if you're new, take an opportunity to say maybe one person who you don't know, or even if you're not new. All right?
didn't want anybody to get hurt. Sing with us. Here. You're still on the stool, she can sing with us. A new member. Who we got up there? We got Simon. Oh, we got oh, we got Naomi. There we go, girl. And a girl. Excellent. And we've got we found out the culprits for the bad weather. They're sitting over there from Michigan because it came from there first. Welcome here, Warren and Debbie. Thanks for coming. Um, a couple of things we ought to know. Uh, Can you play with your the, there's, Peter Smith was supposed to come from the Gideons. He can't make it here today. But if you were to go downstairs after the service, you'll find a lot of Gideon stuff there, including lots of free Bibles and things like that. Do take a vi- of that and enjoy that. It's okay, Dad. Come around. Um, Lighthouse is cancelled for tonight. That is a, sh- a real shame because we've been praying about looking forward to that. As I said in my email, not wasted. Everything people put into that, prayed for, the Lord knows, and we will hopefully be able to reschedule that and certainly have Sam back as the speaker. John the Baptist Day, we're 170 this year. Some of us remember that opening date. Um, that's what people say about me anyway. Um, so just make sure that that's in your, in your diary. We're going to have a lot of fun on that day. Um, Transformed is a, a, a wonderful course, co-written by one of our uh, members here, Ali. And so it's a, it's a great way to just work through some really important stuff in your life. Margaret and Ali are going to be uh, running a course. So if you'd like to know, anyone, or if you know anyone who needs to go through that, could you have a chat with Margaret after the service? Margaret's at the back, and she's going to give us a wave. Thank you. And then Lighten Our Church Family. So this, this is uh, the baby shower for Diana. There she is in the middle. Um, yay. So thank you for going to that. Thank you for those who prepared it. And keep praying for Diana. This has been a, a, a long journey for her to, to get pregnant and then get this far uh, for, for the baby due this month. So look at that, eh? Good food. Lots of good food. Um, and then, Bob, you're going to say something about mission? There we go. You're up and running. Hi there. Um, in order to support our missions team here at St. John's, next uh, Sunday we're going to be um, helping the Richmond Hill, town, town of Richmond Hill, pick up um, litter at the um, retail mall up at uh, in, uh, Stovall Side Road and Young Street. So we will be meeting at 11.45 at the front of the church here, and I will have gloves and bags for, every, for the folks that, that, that want to come. Everyone's invited. And um, if you have your own gloves, you are, you are, you're welcome to, uh, to bring them, okay? Thanks. Thank you, Bob. Um, we'd like to stand. We're going to sing together. We're going to pray first. Father God, we thank you that whatever going on in the world, you are constant. You are always on the throne. You are always our Father, and you reign and rule. But thank you, too, for your holiness. Thank you that you're a a God who is pure, awesome, and yet you invite us into your presence, and that's only possible because of the death of Jesus on the cross and amazing grace. Help us to remember that this morning so we can approach your throne with confidence, but never take it lightly, knowing that we're only there because of your goodness, kindness, and grace. Bless us this morning with your presence, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Love is mighter and so much stronger. 
the King of glory, the King of love, who shakes the whole with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in our wonder, the King of glory, the King of love.
Would you join with me in saying these words from Ephesians chapter 2? But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We are going to move uh, ahead a little bit here. Um, we're not, we can pray for our children today, but they're not going to be going away with us uh, today. They're going to be staying in, and then we'll move on to confession from there. So, Father God, thank you for these wonderful kids who are here today and made it with us. Thank you for getting them here safely. Thank you for our visiting uh, youth and the young adults today. Um, we thank you for their presence. We thank you for their lives. We thank you um, that their parents have brought them here today. Amen. Please have a seat. Amen. Thank you. Um, we talk about grace a lot, and uh, that will come up in my talk later on. Uh, grace is only of value if it's received. Grace is free, but you have to receive it. And one of the most obvious times we receive it is when we acknowledge our own mess-ups and come with confidence to God, a holy God, and know that we can be forgiven, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done for us. And so we have two areas that we confess to God, things that he already knows about, of course. We're not surprising him at this moment. We confess what we did that we shouldn't have done, the words we said we shouldn't have said, the thoughts we had we shouldn't have thought. But we also confess what we didn't do that we should have done, which I think is the bigger part of it, to be honest with you. All those opportunities that we missed because we said, I want to do it my way not believing that God has a better plan for our lives than we do. And so we see in, in those verses, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And then if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, that's a problem. That's sin as well. And so confession is those two sides, the commission, the passive stuff, and the omission, the active things we should have done. And Jesus sets us free. Jesus on the cross sets us free. Not just to be forgiven, but then to live in the ways that are better, live in the new life. So um, here's the promise from Isaiah 43, 25, one of our favorite verses here. God speaking, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. God says, I hate seeing my children messed up. I want to clean you up. I do it for my sake. And I promise to remember your sins no more. What do we need to do? We need to be honest before God. We need to confess our sins and then ask him to forgive us, receive that forgiveness because we're truly sorry, and then ask him to help us live differently. Let's be quiet for a moment and do some business with God. Hebrews chapter 4 reassures us that when we come to Jesus, we come to one who understands what it's like to be fully human, tempted just as we were and are, but was without sin. He didn't give in. And when we come to his throne, where he rules and reigns, we discover it's a throne of grace. So, Father, we take advantage of that. We confess our sins. We're ashamed of them. 
but we know that you've forgiven us. We receive that forgiveness and we tell you we're really sorry for choosing to go our way and not yours. We pray that you'd send your Holy Spirit upon us now to change the way we think so that we speak and act differently in ways that will bring you glory and indeed ways that will bring us life. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and uh, sing about God's amazing grace. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Don't you love grace? It's amazing. I can't, get, I can't get enough of it. I hope I never get tired of it. Amen? Amen. Do please take a seat. Um, thank you guys very much indeed. And I want to just give a shout out to these guys. They came in here really quite early this morning. 
uh, been practicing away. And Adam there shoveled the pathways, did all the hard work as well. So thank you, team. Really appreciate it. Um, we got an opportunity this morning, small in number, often I quite like that, um, to just briefly share personal stuff about what God has been doing in life, something to encourage us. So if there's something that God's been doing, you want to say, yay, God, um, then here's an opportunity. Open mic. Um, put your hand up. It doesn't have to be long. Make it personal. What's God been up to? There we go. Go for it, Bob. Yeah, on Thursday, I had a uh, gastro- gastroscopy at China Western Hospital, and all went well, actually. So I want to thank God for his grace and his mercy and his healing powers. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Could you pass over to Rick? He's right behind and put his hand up. Uh, yeah, I was pretty lucky this week. Well, it wasn't lucky. It was God's prayers answered, I guess. I, uh, as you know, I'm a landscaper, so the weather hasn't been good <laughs> for landscaping. And I was pretty tight for cash, and I knew I had some bills coming up. And I've had a particular piece of item for sale for the longest time. And yesterday, three young young men came and purchased this in the crazy, crazy snow weather, a sea dew of all things and paid, and I'm able to get my bills all paid and have a little extra to whatever. <laughs> till, the, till the next month. Till God we provides. Get, till we get working I think again. he's going to offer us all lunch, but he but, won't. Okay, so. <laughs> but it was a miracle that the three boys came yesterday of all days. I think that's quite crazy, actually, between you and me, but thank you. God's good. God provides. Anybody else? Simon, welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, Jevin and I uh, were down this week with uh, 1,200 of our closest friends in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, at a conference. I'd love to tell you lots about it, but uh, I'm just so grateful. Uh, We drove back with um, Nathan Fullerton, who many of you know, and an intern of his. Uh, We left after the conference ended on Friday and drove all night and got in at about 5 in the morning, which we were really hurting yesterday, and then we were getting lots of messages from other people who had stayed over and we're then driving back in all of the crazy weather. So we're grateful for the safety that God provided for us and that all of those friends who we were praying for yesterday, getting messages and texts, they all made it home uh, safely too um, through the, the crazy weather. So praise God. Thank you. Anybody else? God's good. Thank you, Father, for hearing prayers. Thank you for Bob's scope and that it went well. And we continue to pray for your healing, Bob, in Jesus' name. Thank you for providing for Rick. You do always provide, and that's an extraordinary way. And thank you for protection for Simon and all those other pastors. We are grateful you're always at work. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we are uh, going to move on to the, the talk, the sermon part of things. Um, Habakkuk. Who was here? Not many of us were actually here last week, were we? So did you all get one of these on the way in? We've got plenty to go around today, so please make sure you've got one, and yeah, you, you can have one, Kes. Um, we've even got them in Farsi this morning, but they, <laughs> yay! I'm not sure that's going to be used. You can if you want to, if you've got your own up there. Yeah, thanks for doing that. That's Arash who translated it for us there. Reza, a joint effort. I like team efforts. That's fantastic. Um, so... Yeah, so have those there. If you've got the pens and paper we, we are going to be talking about in my talk, we, we encourage people to make notes in what we're doing as well. We believe the Word of God is always relevant whenever we look at it for our lives today. Shall we pray together? Father God, thank you for your Word. Thank you. This was written maybe 2,600 or more years ago. It was relevant then. It is powerfully relevant today. Would you speak to us this morning? in ways that we can apply it practically to our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, because some of you weren't here last week, because some of you might have forgotten if you were here anyway, um, I thought we'd do a little overview of chapter one, which we looked at last week. We're doing this in three hits. So this is just to bring everyone up to speed. Habakkuk, uh, we believe, was a priest and a prophet in the temple, which was based in Jerusalem, the capital city of Judah. And he had the privilege of living uh, through a time of revival. Uh, some of us have been praying for revival for a long time. Revival is when people turn back to God 
literally in their thousands, hundreds of thousands, and it's a buzzing time. You, can't, you pinch yourself thinking, this is amazing. King Josiah was the king at the time, amazing king. And what, what we see, the principle is when the leaders are godly and they put their eyes on Jesus, or in Josiah's case, on Yahweh, then the, the whole country gets his act together. And there's, the people were prosperous, and God provided and protected. Amazing time. Habakkuk would have been in the temple. He'd have seen the temple full. People just worshiping the living God. In 609 BC, though, Josiah dies. And his son becomes king. His name is Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim is just the opposite of his dad. He's an evil man. And what really throws Habakkuk is in the space of a year to two years, everything goes wrong. Suddenly, no one is worshipping the living God. They're all worshipping idols. There's injustice in the courts. There's, there's people taking advantage of other people. It's, he sums it up in chapter 1, verse 2, violence. Everywhere you look, violence. And he's like, this is awful. And so he cries out to God. And we get these two great uh, phrases in chapter 1. Habakkuk complains. Complains to God. Have you ever complained to God? Habakkuk thought it was okay to do that. He had that sort of relationship. I complain to God. What are you doing, God? This is taking place, and where are you? And my suspicion is that what he wanted with God was to move hands, move his mighty hand, and they want to come back to to the revival again, because he loved that part. And God gives an answer, which I think surprises Habakkuk anyway. And he says, no, I've got a different plan. I'm raising up a new superpower. We're going to call it Babylon. And they're going to take out your nation. And they're really nasty people. And they're like, what? That's not a good plan, God. How can evil deal with evil? This is bad. God, no. And so we have his second complaint. God, you can't be serious. But what we see in that second complaint is Habakkuk also gets his head on straight. It's important that. And he recognizes God is God. He's right. He's holy. He's pure. He's just. And he's on the throne. And he rules. And so he gets himself to a point where he says, okay, I don't understand but I'm prepared for you to do what you have to do. And so chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I'm to give to this complaint. That's a great position of humility, isn't it? I'm going to wait for God to respond. And we don't know how long he he, he waited. And when God does respond, and that's chapter 2, we're going to read it in a second, he doesn't hear what he wants to hear. God doesn't give the response he wants. But he does respond in such a way that Habakkuk changes completely. And in chapter 3, which we'll get to next week, God willing, we see Habakkuk is worshipping God. His heart has changed. So let's have a look at these verses. Um, Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright. This is the key phrase here. But the righteous person will live by his faith. Then this phrase reverts back to the first part of verse 4. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. Because he is as greedy as the grave, and like death is never satisfied, he gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey. Because you've plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted ruin of many peoples, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out, and the beams of the woodwork will echo it. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord Almighty determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors pouring it from the wineskin till they're drunk so that he can gaze on their naked bodies you'll be filled with shame instead of glory now it is your turn 
Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming round to you and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you've done to Lebanon will overwhelm you and your destruction of animals will terrify you. For you've shed human blood. You've destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. Of what value is an idol carved by a craftsman or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to word, come to life or to a lifeless stone. Wake up. Can it give guidance? It's covered with gold and silver. There's no breath in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. There's a lot of heavy stuff in there, really, isn't it? Um, and lots of powerful stuff. And if you're from Lebanon, a background there, welcome here. Who knew that was coming, eh? You see. Um, the righteous will live by faith. That's the key verse here. We're going to come to it in a moment. But first of all, let's just put ourselves again with Habakkuk. There he is, faithfully waiting. You've got to love this guy. He's complained. He's waiting. And then God breaks the silence. And let's look at what he says. Get those readings out again if you have. And what he says is write down the revelation. God is the great communicator. He always has been. Jesus' name is the Word. He's nearly always communicating with us. Sometimes it's hard to hear him. Sometimes we feel like we're in a sort of wasteland. But we have the Bible, the Word of God. That's never going to change. And God, when he communicates with us, I think he's saying to us, as he said to Habakkuk, when you hear from God, write it down. Write it down. If you get a verse of Scripture when you're reading the Bible, how are you going to hear from God? That's the most normal way to hear from God, by the way, is through the Bible, so you've got to read it. Write it down. Make a note of it. When you get a picture, write it down. Draw it if you're that way. I can't draw a stick man, so I wouldn't. I would have to write it down. Okay, don't, don't have me on your Pictionary team. Do not have me on your Pictionary team, okay? If just draw stick men, and I can't do that. Okay? When you hear someone say something in a, in a, in a sermon maybe or in a, a, a group that you're in, write it down. Why? Two reasons. One, you will forget if you don't. Okay, just the way it works. You forget. I forget. What am I going to say next? I forgot. No, I mean, you forget, all right? So write it down. Two, because we are reproducers and not receivers. Receivers in the main are very selfish people. Receivers' attitude is, what's there? I'm going to take it. It's for me. It's all about me. So again, if you're sitting here, I'm going to beat you up for a second, but you don't have to admit this. If you're sitting here listening to this talk and your attitude is, I'm just going to listen for something that's relevant to me. That's it. That's all I'm interested in. Is, is he going to say anything that hits me? You are the definition of a receiver. And if there's something relevant to you, you'll make a little note of it, maybe. And the rest of it, you'll think, oh, I don't know, that was a waste of time. I don't know what he was talking about. But if you're a reproducer, you'll take notes on everything. Faithfully, you'll take notes because you'll think, there'll be something for me. That's great. But I'll have something for other people. I can take it to others, and that might be relevant to them. So if you haven't started already, grab a pen, please. Take the notes. That's why I produce them every single week. Make some notes. The other benefit is you remember twice as much simply by taking notes. That's the way it works. Okay? Next thing he says, though, is make it plain on tablets. In other words, there are no prizes for making God's message complicated. Okay, we don't hand out prizes for that. Well done, you spoke in such a way I had no idea what you were saying. Right? We don't hand out prizes for that. Now, that's, that's, that's different from dumbing it down. I'm not about dumbing down theology. I'm just saying, can we speak in English without jargonese and Christianese and long, clever words when, we, when no one gets them? Okay? So speak clearly. Know the gospel. It's clear. It's simple. And then the purpose, so that heralds may run with it. A herald was someone who took news. Guess what? We're all called heralds. We've all got news, and our news is great news, and we're to take this news to everyone, everywhere. So what was the revelation, I hear you ask? Good answer, good question. It awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end. It's the first thing that Habakkuk's told about this revelation. So what that's code for, let's break it down. It's very simple. Is God saying to Habakkuk, I'm going to tell you something which is for a future time, about a future time. 
Now, again, our danger with that is, well, if it's not to my time, I'm not that interested. And I get that. And when I explain what's going on, you go like, well, that's not very helpful either. Because actually this message is for a near future and a distant future. Habakkuk didn't get the distant future, but the Word of God tells us that. The near future is this. Remember that God had said to Habakkuk, this superpower, Babylon, is going to come in and take you out. And Habakkuk's going like, that's not good. So God's saying, not changing my mind on that, but what I'm telling you is, when you get taken into captivity, there will be a finite time to that. It'll come to an end. The, Jew, the Jews will not be in captivity forever. And you go like, oh, that's a relief. Until you find out how long it is. Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah was a prophet at the same time as Habakkuk. This whole country will become a desert wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for, ouch, 70 years. But when 70 years are fulfilled, I'll punish the king of Babylon and his nation, and, and so he goes on. I'm a really young man. You can tell that just by looking at me after my go faster haircut last night as well. Thank you, love. All right. If someone said to me it's going to be over in 70 years, I'm just, I'm not interested really. <laughs> I don't think I'll be walking the planet in 70 years' time. Most people here will be thinking the same thing. If you're in your 20s, you're going to be in your 90s. Yay, Ray, released from captivity, you know. So there's a, it's, it's got a sort of, it's, it's a, not a that helpful, is it, if you happen to be around, but it was really helpful for those who were taken into captivity because they held on to that truth. And indeed, when 70 years were up, they prayed it in. And they were released under King Cyrus to come back to Jerusalem. But there was a longer term application. This is where it becomes relevant to us. This also applied to the second coming of Jesus. Habakkuk didn't know about that. He didn't even know about Jesus for that matter. All right? Here's what the writer of Hebrews does. Hebrews is a great book to read if you want to understand the, the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament. Because he encapsulates it all in 13 chapters. You've got a whole Old Testament, lots of books, 13 chapters. Lots of books, read 13 chapters, you get a lot more there. Okay? And in chapter 10, verses 37 and 38, he quotes verses 3 and 4 from Habakkuk chapter 2. But you'll notice that he changes a word. I've, I've highlighted it so you can see. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. The writer, inspired by the Holy Spirit, changes the word it to he. Changes it. He says, the Holy Spirit saying, this was a prophetic word about the second coming of Jesus. And that whole chapter, chapter 10, is all about Jesus and his return. So we see there's this, this book that most people don't read at all, because it's very small and hard to find in the sticky pages of our Bible, actually has an extraordinary message about the second coming. I said before last week, these prophets are called minor prophets, not because they're unimportant, just because they're short. In fact, we should read them more frequently because they're really quick and easy to read. Moving on, because we want to get to the, the, the nub of what I want to talk about. God then tells Habakkuk that there are going to be five woes against Babylon. It turns up five times, 6, 9, 12, 15, and 19. Those verses, you'll see the word, Whoa! Whoa, whoa, okay? What he's saying is, these guys, these, these Babylonians, they're going to be held account for their atrocities. They're not going to get away with it. In a moral universe, every bill is paid. That's coming. We're not going to look at those five. They're very nasty. What really happens is it just it gets awful. We're going to look at the last one if I get there at the end of this talk. But what I want to look at is this. In violent and difficult times... And if you were here last week, we, I think we all acknowledged that we live in violent times too. What Habakkuk needed and what we need is the assurance that God is for us, that God is aware of what's going on, and that God is in control. And so we have three assurances from God here in this passage to Habakkuk. I'm going to look at those three. You can see them in the notes as well. No big surprise. The first is God's grace. And just before I speak about this, a little shout out here for those who chose the songs this morning. As far as I know, they didn't know I was going to have as a, my main point, God's grace. The word grace does not appear in this chapter. And yet every song we sung was about grace. And when I saw that the other day, I was like, wow. I love the way the Holy Spirit brings that together, works with the teams here 
to get those songs. So just a, a little reminder that when folk are, uh, they're not just rehearsing songs, they're praying in what we should do. They're listening to the Lord, leading us that way. So thank you, whoever chose those songs. Uh, that was fantastic. It, it really gave me an encouragement when I saw that on Friday, and I thought, wow, we're on the same page this morning. That's brilliant. So what he wants to say here is, remember God's grace. God's grace is amazing. It's outrageous. It's um, astonishing. And yet all too quickly we can forget grace. We take it for granted. He contrasts here the puffed up and the righteous. You'll see that in verse 4. So he's showing now the puffed up are the Babylonians. Here's a quote from King Nebuchadnezzar. Great if you have a Scrabble game and you can get that in. I don't think there's two Zs in Scrabble, but good luck anyway. Um, you get a lot of points. Um, this is what Nebuchadnezzar says. At the height of his power, the height of the Babylonian Empire, and I've highlighted the key words so you can't miss it. Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Okay, even, even I couldn't miss that. He is boasting about what he has done. Now, if you know Daniel chapter 4, God takes him out straight away. It's worth reading that one. Whoa! The words are barely off his lips. And he's dealt with. Now, it's easy to point fingers at people who are arrogant and prideful. The problem is, of course, that we acknowledge that God is in opposition to the proud, but we're all proud. That's the salutary moment. We're all proud. We're all about me. James chapter 4, God opposes the pride, proud but gives grace to the humble. And that leads to the problem. Since that's all of us, we're not Nebuchadnezzar's, but all of us are in this mess, then we are actually in opposition to God. And then in the middle of that verse, and I pointed out as we read it, Habakkuk sort of has a hiccup as he's writing, doesn't he? And he, he just writes this, this little bracketed phrase. Then goes back to describe the puffed up in the rest of the verse. And he uses these words. The righteous person will live by his or her faith. And this verse is quoted three times in the New Testament. In Romans chapter 1, Galatians 3, and as we've seen in Hebrews 10. And it's one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. Fancy that. In the middle of this little book that most people have never heard of, let alone read, it's this key verse. Thank goodness some people read it because actually it's the verse that was formative in the Reformation. The Reformation we celebrated last year, 500 years ago, the Reformation, when the church and people turned back to the living God. This was the verse. Martin Luther said this, this text was to me the true gate of paradise. And we're like, wow, I would never read Habakkuk. Imagine Luther pouring over this Bible, the book, and coming across this verse, and it changes everything. Because one of the most important questions is this. Who will God accept, and who will he reject, and why? Just a bit of background on Luther, where he was coming from. Luther was a trained lawyer. Brilliant mind. He knew the law. He was also brought up in the Christian faith. He knew about a holy God, he knew about God's laws, and he agreed that God's laws are perfect and wonderful, and he also knew that he couldn't keep them, and it devastated him. He couldn't fool himself. He couldn't do the pretend game that so many of us are good at doing. You know, on the outside, I'm great, I'm great, I'm wonderful, praise God, and inside going, like, I'm a complete failure, I'm completely messing up. So Luther decided that the thing that to do, what would really help him is if I become a monk, that will really help me. Now I'll get serious about it, and I'll be devoted, and I'll be full-time, and, and then I'll be able to get it right. And he becomes a monk, and it gets worse. And his words again, he did it in German, I can't do that, but in English, he was tormented by guilt, shame, and condemnation. The harder he tried, the more he knew he failed. This was his problem. Luther was not able to just let it rest. He struggled. But like Habakkuk, he cried out to God. He listened, he waited, and he read the word. And as he was reading Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, 
His words, not mine. The Spirit revealed to him the wonderful truth of grace. Spirit showed to him, you will never be able to earn your salvation. You can't work your way there. You will always fail. But your salvation is not dependent upon yourself. It's dependent on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so many of you will know it's that difference between the word do and the word done. If you try and do it, if you try and work your way there, you will never succeed. If you look at what Jesus has done, it's all done for us, then you just accept his finished work. And that assurance of God's grace transformed his life, and as a result, and no exaggeration here, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. That's the Reformation. That's what happened. That's why read, we read earlier on from chapter 2 of Ephesians, it is by grace you've been saved through faith. Some people have said to me, well, you know, I, I, it's okay for you, but I, I, I don't have faith like you had. I wish I had your faith. And my rather cynical response is, no, you can't have my faith. Get your own. Which isn't that helpful until you read that God says, no, nobody has the saving faith they need. Because if you did, you'd boast about it. You'd say you made a contribution to your salvation. Hey, I got in because I had the faith. Look at it, it says, and this is not from yourself, it's a gift from God. Even the faith that you need to become a follower of Jesus is given to you. Not by works. No one gets to boast. The only contribution you make to your salvation is your mess up, is your need to be saved. And this led to the liberating, fantastic truth of justification by faith. Now note that the word justification means to be declared not guilty. It doesn't mean to be declared innocent. Okay? I'm not innocent. I am guilty. That's the truth, isn't it? And so are you. We've all messed up. There's only one innocent person. That's Jesus. He's the only one who lived and didn't mess up. We're guilty. But if we follow Jesus Lord, if we accept his finished work on the cross, the done bit, then when I stand before God, and when you stand before God, on that day, the day that the writer of Hebrews says is coming, the second coming, and God says to me and to you, to our face, are you guilty? Did you live your life in your own terms? Did you, were you all that? Oh, I'm going to say, well, yeah, I'm guilty. The moment I do that, Jesus, if you've accepted him as Lord, steps in and says, but I paid the punishment in full for Peter. I took it all. It's all done. And I'm going like, I sort of knew that, but now I see it, and that's so wrong, and it's so unfair. And Jesus says, I know it's unfair, but I love you, and I died for you, and you accepted that. And then the Father says to me, you are not guilty. And the cheat way of remembering what justified means, it is just as if I'd never done it. I'm set free. Of course, if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Lord now, when you stand before God at that moment, you admit you're guilty, and then you have to take the punishment yourself. You didn't ask for the substitute. You didn't lean on his work. The moment you accept Jesus Christ, whenever that is, you were justified. It's actually in the past tense. It's a, it's a finished work. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Since we have been, past tense, you'll note, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How are we justified? Well, I've already told you, haven't I? By faith in Jesus our Lord. I told you at the beginning, Christianity is simple. It's not a complex faith, all right? That's why I love verses like Romans 10, 9. Here are the two-step process of becoming a follower of Jesus. You've never done it. It's this simple and profound. Number one, declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord. That isn't just a statement that you declare without engaging your brain, nor is it a statement that you engage your brain but not mean with your whole being. We to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So to declare that he is Lord, that means he's God. He's boss, he's number one, and I'm not, means all of my life now is submitted to him. I will follow him. Every part of who I am is under his lordship. If I decide to keep a little bit apart for myself, you know, you can have Sundays, and you can have a couple of nights a week, and you can have this, but my work life and my social life, that's all separate. I want to do those things. He's not lord. 
We can't bargain with God and say, this part is for you and this part is for me. Because all the part that's for me is actually going to lead to death. That's the sins of omission we, we prayed about earlier on, remember? It's all. The moment you find yourself saying, but I, I want to I wanna do my thing, you know that you've, you don't have Jesus as Lord. So it's an all-in thing. And when we do that to start with, we have no idea what we're setting ourselves up for. And so we pray for God's help. We always do. Like, oh my goodness, I think it's going to be hard. But the Holy Spirit will help us. And the second claim is, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Believe in the resurrection. Now, does Easter feel a long time ago? Now, last year, this was Easter Day. Effectively, the equivalent. We celebrate the resurrection. The resurrection, remember, was the vindication of of everything Jesus claimed about himself, that he's God, all his teaching, and the cross, and what he achieved. We believe that to be true. If you do those two things, you will be saved. Note the order. It doesn't say, Jesus, I want you to be my savior, and later on, oh, I, might, I might follow you as Lord. If you just have Jesus as savior, you accept saving, but then you'll stay Lord of your life. That is not biblical. Not there. It says if you have Jesus as Lord, he will by default be your savior too. So many in the church have got it the wrong way around, which is why we have too many Christians who are not following Jesus, but claiming to be Christians because they've taken the benefit of the cross, but not wanted to follow the Lord. And so this is received by faith alone, the great Reformation mantra. By faith alone, not merited, it's a gift. Through grace alone, not earned, it's a gift. In Christ alone, not deserved, it's a gift. So what does, thank you, so what does that sort of faith look like in everyday life? Very briefly, let's learn again from Habakkuk. Because I think, you know, it's great to talk about faith. And as I said, believing faith is given to us, but living it out is hard. And we, Habakkuk is such a great guy to learn from. He's a guy clearly frustrated Faith doesn't mean that all the problems disappear. Although as we were talking in the young adults group on Friday, this is the only time we get to exercise faith. This life, the next life, we don't need faith. We're gonna, we'll be with God. So this is our opportunity to live that out. It's pleasing to God when we trust his promises. What does it look like? Well, when you get frustrated with God, note I said when, not if. You take your frustrations to him. And you're honest about it. And you wait patiently for him to respond, because he will. As um, Hebrews 11 defines faith, faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. Faith is a four-letter word spelled S-U-R-E, sure, confident in God's promises, even if we don't understand. I spent most of my time on the first one. I will be much quicker on these next two. Okay, the second assurance of God's glory. One of those marvelous verses. Um, we used to sing, there used to be lots of songs. We haven't had modern songs with this verse in time. We brought it back, songwriters. Okay? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk needed to know that the, despite the chaos that was going to take place, and the next 20 years was going to be awful in Judah as these Babylonians kept coming in and invading and taking people captive, and then in 587, 586, actually destroy Jerusalem completely and take them all captive. He needs to know that one day, God's glory would be everywhere. And so he does a contrast again. He likes the contrast. Babylon's great empire, God's eternal kingdom. And effectively, what, what we read in those verses that we're not looking at in detail is if we try and build our kingdom... It never lasts. Anything we build without God always falls apart. Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Okay? Every time people have tried to build a utopia, it always ends in disaster. Do we learn from that lesson? But God's eternal kingdom, Jesus says, I will build my church. It's Jesus' church. It's not mine. It's certainly not yours. It's Jesus's. He will build it. And when he comes, that final time, Babylon, sorry, the second coming, then God's glory will indeed be over the whole earth. Now, I said I want to look at that fifth woe just briefly because the fifth woe is about idolatry, which is about glory. Because really, idolatry is about who receives glory. Idolatry is about who is worthy of worship. And only God is worthy of worship. That's the bottom line. 
worship anything or anyone apart from God, and you are in idolatry. Put God first, focus on Him, and you get it right. Okay? So, the Babylonians, as we saw in verse 19, they worship wood and stone. And we would laugh at that now, don't we? Ha, 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 how foolish can you be? And yet we do the same sort of stuff. Here's the problem is the people of Judah were also worshiping idols. They were in flagrant violation of that second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or on the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. They're all guilty of it. So what is idolatry? This is actually, we've had this conversation a few times recently. I thought I'd give the definition, I think it's a brilliant one, from Romans chapter 1, verse 25. Worshipping and serving the creature rather than the creator. Nice and simple again, isn't it? When you, when you worship something that is creative, idols are a dead substitute for the living God. I mean, isn't it bonkers to, to worship something that human beings created rather than worshiping the one who created human beings? I mean, hello? It's not that difficult to think it through, really, is it? So whatever people delight in other than God. And you know the modern trends. I'm just going to say stuff you already know. People worship famous people. And that's not to say that if you're famous, you're asking people to worship you. Some are, I think, but some aren't. They just happen to be famous. But people still worship them, whether they're movie stars or celebrities or politicians or wealthy tycoons. I think here's what's funny is people worship dead famous people. I think that's quite strange as well. Not saying they worship Michael Jackson, but did you know that uh, $75 million is what his estate earned last year? Not bad for a dead dude, is it? People worship man-made things. You know, your car, house, boat, jewelry, artwork. Nothing wrong with those things unless they come before God. Albert Schweitzer said this, if you own something you cannot give away, then you don't own it. It owns you. That's quite telling, isn't it? Quite clear as well. Social position, that's a big one, isn't it? I like my title. I like my corner office at work. I like my special place at school. I like the favor that I've got. I like it. You know, that's important, isn't it? I want to be someone known, someone respected, someone that it's my turn to be up there and trample on everybody else, whatever it might be. Uh, appetites, carnal pleasures, whatever they might be, addictions. And of course, intellectual ability. That's a terrible idol to worship your IQ and refuse to submit to God's word. And then the final assurance, God's government. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Empires rise and fall. I am a Brit. I've seen, well, I saw the end of mine. My, my country is gone. Don't even call them the Empire Games anymore. We're finishing the Commonwealth Games. Okay? Go on. All right? God is on his throne. He's in control. He's King of Kings. He's Lord of Lords. And we saw last week and we saw two weeks ago at Easter that the solution to suffering and evil is the cross. It's Jesus on the cross defeating them both. That is an interesting phrase. There will be a day when the whole earth is silent before God. Revelation tells us there's a, there was a period of silence for 30 minutes. It doesn't seem very long that. I'm sure 30 minutes sounds a, feels a long time, though, at, at that moment. It's that moment depicted again at the judgment day when we all stand before God. And some of us have thought of all the things we're going to tell God. <laughs> and when I come face to face, God, let, let me tell you. I'm going to have a few words with him. Have you heard people say that? Have you said it yourself? I've got my excuses. <laughs> at that moment, we'll have nothing to say. <laughs> we'll realize, ah, okay, you're God and I'm not. And the, this is the tragic thing. This is where I'm going to sort of finish, really. The puffed up, those who never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, they will face judgment. And they will be judged fairly, because God is a fair judge on their actions, and be found guilty. And the judgment is to be sent away from God. Now, please never think that God has any delight in that at all. I believe there will be tears in the Father's eyes. He created every single person, knows us better than we know ourselves, loved us, perfectly formed us in our mother's womb. 
Do you think he delights in that? Never get the idea that God is rubbing his hands with joy that people are going to be spending eternity away from him. He demonstrated with a scarred body on a cross how much he loves us. That is not a day of celebration. It's a day of an awful day for all. And those who've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord, those who are the righteous, declared by faith, not deserving it at all, yes, will be welcomed to spend eternity with him, and we will do so with delight and joy and because of grace. But I think that part of that silence, part of that silence will be the horror of seeing those folk who are away from God. Does it motivate you? as it does me, to go and tell people the good news. That we could populate hell and depopulate heaven, populate heaven and depopulate hell, get the wrong way around. That we could get people to spend eternity with God. That's a motivation to me, that on that day, I don't want to see my family, my friends, my neighbors, my colleagues, anybody, anybody, sent away from God's presence. This vision changed Habakkuk's life. Didn't get what he expected to get, but he goes from being a warrior in chapter one to being a watcher in chapter two and a worshiper in chapter three. That's how it changed his life. This vision changed Luther's life. As a result, this vision changed my life. Here's the question, will it change your life? And together, in the power of the Spirit, will we help it change the lives of those around us. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it never goes out of date. There's always relevant and personal and challenging and yet uplifting and, and brings hope. Even in Habakkuk's day when things seemed hopeless. Help us to hold on to those assurances, Father. Your grace, your glory, and your government. But help us not to be passive in this. We truly do want to depopulate hell and populate heaven. We don't want to be just receivers. We want to be reproducers. We want to herald this good news wherever we go. So look upon us now with favor. Send your spirit upon us now. Don't let us rest until the world has heard the good news, until those we know have accepted Jesus' finished work on the cross and that you declare them righteous, not guilty, and welcome into your family, Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing again? We're going to go back to court. Well, why not? And I think we're going to pick up a collection. If you're a guest here, be our guest. It's just fantastic you're with us. Thanks for joining us. Let's stand.
is grace. This is grace. Unchanging, unfailing. This is grace. great song. What a great thing grace is. Thank you guys so much for coming out today. I pray that you've met with the Father, that you know the Son loves you and dies for you. I pray that you know the Spirit is for you and will never leave you. And I ask that you would take that message wherever you go. Father, we ask you to bless us again. We're never going to get tired of asking you to bless us. You promise in your word that you give every spiritual blessing to your children. But our desire is to take that blessing, run with it, and bless as many people as possible. Send us out from here to make a difference. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. We're doing our God, Christine. (laughs) Our God, Christine?
Be safe. <laughs> yeah, be safe.